Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson and sit up, get a coffee. This is one exciting story that I want you all to listen very closely to. I am talking with Maurice Strang. He is the non-executive deputy chairman of Vectus Biosystems, as well as the co-founder. Now, I'm going to get Maury to talk to you about what they're doing, but it's very exciting. I had a chat with Maury earlier today and what these guys are doing for the human race, if you like, in terms of how biotech can really help us is quite frankly, extraordinary. They've been flying a little bit under the radar. And so I'm really excited to share this all with you today. A great story and they're only just getting started. Maury, great to see you. Thanks for joining me on Small Caps. Thanks for having me on. Now, Maury, this is the first time you and I have had a chat. So rather than me giving all the secrets away, why don't you give us a brief overview of who are Vectus and then we'll get into some of the detail. Yes, so thank you. Vectus Biosystems is a ASX listed biotech, but we see ourselves as a discovery company. And by that, I mean, uh, we don't intend to take the drugs all the way through, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars of trials. Uh, we're partnering with a range of pharma companies. Uh, we have about a thousand compounds in the library. And whilst the original discovery was a peptide, which requires daily injection, we have now reduced it to a small molecule, which is one pill a day. And the market we're targeting is represents about 40% of mortality in the world. And that is fibrotic damage to the kidneys, the heart, the lungs, and the liver. And uh, our technologies and our compounds are considered transformational. They don't just slow down disease, they actually are aimed at reversing it. And I'm pleased to say we've just completed in Australia uh, our phase 1A clinical trials, which were um, very successful and has positioned us in a uh, you know, strong uh, position to um, now carry on our pharma discussions. Well, it sounds like it's getting quite interesting. If I can go back one step, because you just said you have a thousand compounds in the library. What does that mean? Because you also said it's one tablet a day. So I'm a little, uh, if that sounds like a lot of compounds, what does that mean? Okay. So a lot of, um, you know, drug discovery and bio, uh, biotech companies, they're either repurposing an existing compound or someone's found something in the Amazon that looks interesting. <laughs> whereas we have, uh, as I said, a thousand patented compounds in our library. Now, only a handful of those uh, are likely to see their way through to the clinic. But as an example, uh, there are certain indications where, um, and liver disease or hepatic disease is one of them, where you don't necessarily want to lower blood pressure. So a cousin of our VB0004, which lowers blood pressure, at the same time reverses da damage to the heart, and uh, to the kidneys, that does lower blood pressure. Uh, A32 uh, in our library does the reversing of the damage to the, kid, uh, to the liver, but doesn't lower blood pressure. So we're able to adapt within our library to the indications we're going after. Now, I don't want to make it confusing, but several of the compounds do many things. And we're in the strong position of choosing the absolute best one to bring forward for the indication we're pursuing. Maury, is anyone else doing anything like what you're doing? So there's two parts to that question. Um, people have looked at VIP, the peptide we started with, and uh, they have not succeeded for a number of reasons, but one of them is in its native form, VIP uh, affects um, a process in the body which gives you some side effects. In developing the small molecule or the once a day pill, we've been able to engineer around those side effects so we don't have them. And so uh, I think we're quite unique in the world of VIP. And Dr. Duggan, our co-founder and CEO, she's highly respected in this community. So uh, she would know if there's something else going on. The other question is who else is trying to slow disease progression and reverse it. Uh, many people are trying. Uh, no one to our knowledge, and we've intersected with some of the most famous names in the pharmaceutical industry, have seen anyone that's a direct competitor at this stage. 
One of the things you said earlier was 40%, I think it was 40% of issues, health issues, come from fibrosis. Why is 40% this- of deaths. So deaths. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, whatever the, the original cause, one of the unfortunate things about um, many forms of fibrosis and scarring is once you set it off, it keeps going. So a great example of that is, unfortunately, uh, hepatitis of various types is very prevalent in Asia. And um, they've discovered some wonderful new drugs that can block the hepatitis, but it doesn't reverse the damage that's already done. And it doesn't stop the continuing damage. So those compounds are worth billions of dollars. Wow. Those antivirals. And that's why we have a lot of interest in Asia and particularly in China for our compounds, because it's a perfect solution. One, you get rid of the cause of the damage. And two, you reverse the damage to a what we call a clinically significant degree. In other words, you're probably going to be able to live a normal life. And I guess that's the key to to what you're doing is it's not just stopping the slowing of it, it's reversing it, reversing this scarring. So as you say, you can live a normal life. And that's the key to what you have. Absolutely. And um, as an example, uh, I've been involved in my career with dialysis for uh, for some time. And the social and economic, it costs between 50 and 150,000 directly to manage one dialysis patient per annum. Wow. And the personal impact is huge. You're spending large sums of your amount of your time in a clinic. Mm. Whereas if you can uh, positively uh, reverse the damage of what's called the interstitial tissue around the, the, uh, the kidneys, they begin functioning again and we believe in many cases those people will not go on to dialysis now there are many reasons for kidney failure and i'm not suggesting it will address every one of them but a significant number so what is vector so where are you at in terms of because we all know that there's lots of steps that you have to get to before I can basically go in if I've got an issue and I can say, give me that tablet that I can take once a day and, and get myself better. Where are you at in that sort of that, that timeline, if you like? So different compounds are at different stages okay. um, and we call them leads or emerging lead. When we've got a lead, it means we're in humans now. And so the very hard work of developing uh, VB0004, which is our cardiovascular drug, doing all the background toxicity studies and the multiple studies of what's called GMP manufacturing. So you have to make it in a pharmaceutical environment. It's all been done. And we just completed our 1A trials in Melbourne at a tier one CRO, clinical research organization, and the results were outstanding. For the other compounds, um, and a thing to remember is VIP itself is conserved across all mammalian species. Now, why is that important? Because the tests we do uh, in the preclinical work are highly likely, as it turns out, they were relevant in the humans, whereas some drugs act completely differently in the animal studies. Yeah. Uh, but right now you're sitting there and I guarantee you, you have VIP in abundance in your major organs. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be smiling as you are now. <laughs> so, so a VIP, a VIP, yes, I'm feeling very VIP at the moment, Bori. What's a VIP? VIP is a peptide um, that has re- a number of functions in you know, keeping uh, the normal function of those major organs. And all the textbook said that as the VIP goes down, if someone tragically goes to a heart transplant, uh, you'll find there's almost no VIP in their heart. So people thought it was a marker. Okay. When you tried to introduce VIP into healthy people, nothing happened other than the side effects, which we don't have happily. But when you introduce it into the diseased organ, there's significant changes. And it's a little like, you know, people talk about vitamins, are they any good for you? Well, if you're deficient in vitamin D, it's really helpful to replace it. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it goes. You know, we saw in olden days there were things like scurvy because people didn't have enough vitamin C. Yeah. So in effect, uh, what we have now is a drug that sets out to restore organ health 
restore organ function, and we believe its safety profile uh, is representative of the fact that it's in all of us as we speak. So uh, is it is it you, you talked about 40 percent of deaths uh, earlier. Is that because we're living longer and therefore scarring becomes more of an issue the older we get? In other words, Maury, is this the is this the elixir of youth? <laughs> Uh, we consider ourselves a very uh, focused and ethical pharmaceutical company and biotech, and we wouldn't use terms like that, but we think it's important. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, you would know that if your heart swells, if it stops functioning or your lungs get fibrotic damage, which is like asbestosis or cold disease, black lung, or even as it now uh, tragically happens through COVID, mm. uh, that scarring is not a disease in itself. It is the result of the disease. And just as vitamin C and vitamin D will restore health, uh, the replacement of a VIP analog or a small molecule uh, is exactly what we're doing. And what's remarkable is the safety of this drug. We've dosed it tens of thousands of times, the, the clinical dose with no side effects. So um, we have a lot of investors that are cardiologists and doctors. Oh, wow. And um, the yes, we have traveled under the radar, but now it is time that the patents are granted. We announced that we're in discussions with leading pharmaceutical companies in worldwide and in certain regions such as Asia and China. And um, in that library of drugs, we've got some compounds that we believe may be very useful in additional indications. And one of them is Alzheimer's. So, um, oh, wow. but this is a journey in medicine and in biotech. It's not about your claims. It's about your proof. There's no doubt that we are, uh, you know, a safe and effective drug, but um, now uh, the journey is to partner with uh, a number of companies and not every pharma company has the same focus. We know companies that are very much in very specialized uh, uh, liver, uh, kidney disease, others that are you know, looking at pulmonary disease, in other words, lung function. Uh, and so whilst VB0004, our lead, has remarkable effects on blood pressure, which downstream, if you normalize the blood pressure, lots of other things go right. Uh, but because that's a relatively crowded market, we're focused from a commercial point of view on what's called first-in-class indications. That means we will not be compensated or judged on the basis of an existing drug. We will be compensated on the basis of what we do to save the healthcare system or the pay all money. And by restoring health, that's the holy grail. Do you think right now, because you said that you're in talks with Big Pharma, I'd love to know which Big Pharma you're talking to, but you probably can't share that with us just yet. That would be a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that as I'm talking to you today, Maury, is this a transformational time with the company? There's no doubt. Um, if we look at what Big Pharma's looking for and we've in extensively engaged with them. Uh, Karen and I were in uh, the biotech conferences in San Diego, JP Morgan in uh, San Francisco, and we wore out our frequent flyer points. Um, Good on you. <laughs> we understand the first thing you have to have is a transformational agent. In other words, something that is worth investing in, that it's not just having, you know, you see these drugs worth a lot of money that extend life by four weeks. Now, from a, from a human point of view, I understand that and it's important, but when you're really making a change, when you're restoring health to people, that is the big ticket. The second thing that they require is your IP has to be pharmaceutical grade. And what we did from day one is we had, very unusual for a small biotech, we had the leading patent attorneys actually in our team. So they were part of the discovery. Now, it was a big investment that we made, and we're very glad because when we sit down with pharma, they 
express admiration to the quality of our IP. Speaking and not one, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. not one patent office or competitor has challenged any of our patents worldwide. I was actually going to just talk to you about IP and, and just to figure out, because you talked about China and Asia and all those sorts of areas, how protected this particular compound is, your lead compound. You know, can somebody else take it apart and do something similar? Or do you think that it's protected enough that, you know, Vectus Biosystems is so far, so much further ahead that no one else can catch you? So that's the right question. Uh, the philosophy that we took in was we not only patented our innovation, but the method of discovery. So in other words, we laid patents over the whole peptide, then the fragments, then the function of the mimetics or the small molecules, the method of manufacture and the method of discovery. So when I say we're pharmaceutical grade, uh, some of the big names that you would have lying in your drawer on boxes <laughs> of medication have expressed the view that they've never seen stronger IP from a pharma or a biotech. All right. So our beautiful audience out there, they're always keen to see what's happening in biotech or mining, whatever. Your ASX code, which I, I must just let everybody know, is V for Victor, B for Bob, S for Sugar, VBS. Um, talk to us about how you're going to get to the next stage. Are you funded enough because you spoke earlier that it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to get to this next stage. How is that going to happen? So um, we are currently debt free uh, with cash in the bank, but uh, I've never seen a biotech company that says it's got too much money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't intend uh, to expend those large sums. It's been made very clear by pharma. Not only do they want to do it themselves, but they insist on doing it themselves. So um, in our case, for a, when I say we're first in class, this is really in, important. There usually is no other treatment that is viable for the indications we're pursuing. So we feel it's much better strategy on behalf of our shareholders to work with the people that have the sales force, the technology and the infrastructure and so we still believe because we're first in class, our upfront fees and royalties will be significant, but they may not be quite as much as someone that takes it through to approval in phase three, but then we haven't spent half a billion either. So what right. we've got in the pipeline is at the moment, five, four emerging leads plus our lead and many areas of research. We've been approached by uh, groups that have interest in eye fibrosis, which is very, very challenging disease. Um, topical uh, fibrosis that you might see as the result of plastic surgery. Uh, we are doing work in COVID and we're doing work in Alzheimer's. So our dance card is full for the next few years at the very least. If your dance card is full, what's the process of taking it forward and how do shareholders benefit? In other words, I guess the question really is around how much do you have to give away and what's what's that, I guess, methodology, methodology or um, what's the word I'm looking for? How do you make sure that shareholders benefit from the upside without giving too much of it away? Certainly. So um, we engaged fairly, first of all, uh, I have a, a background in this field and I've probably done more licenses than anyone else in Australia across medtech and okay. the like. Secondly, we engage the services of some of the leading professionals in the world to advise us on engaging with pharma. And as you would see, there is a company, uh, I'm very proud that a lot of this work's being done in Australia. So am so, I. Um, there is a company called Fibrotech that had an existing compound and they did a major deal with an English company which got taken over. We know them very well, but that was a $600 million package. Uh, we believe ours will be far, far larger. And so if you look at the compounds, if we get an initial compound um, license to a pharma partner, the data at this stage of our development 
the data would have a range of, this is not a prediction, I'm referring to data. Yep. The data would show that these companies are valued on the NASDAQ between 250 million US and 750 million US without transformational agents and with only a single compound. So the upside for our shareholders, our market cap is a little under 50 million, um, just uh, fully diluted. We had some convertible notes and happily they all converted. They're all true believers. And so I think the upside uh, for our shareholders is as significant as any company on the ASX. It's pretty exciting times. Um, I'm talking to you in late October 2022. What's the news flow going to be between uh, over the next six months, let's say? So we already have clinical approval for our 1B study and on VB0004, and that means that we can start to look for efficacy in patients that have disease but are not on pharmaceutical treatment. So that's what a 1B study is. Uh, our confidence level on that 1B study is as strong as it can be. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, that's not holding us up. Uh, we're talking to uh, a wide variety of companies. And I have to say that the pushback we had prior to doing our phase one clinical is these markets are so big, they don't want to fail on safety. Now that we have the safety study done, I think um, we're in the bullseye of a lot of companies. Um, do you choose one? Do you choose many? Uh, does one take a certain compound and run with it? How does it work in the bigger picture? So that's really um, an interesting question. Uh, it depends. I could say generically, apart from size, there are two kinds of pharma companies. Those that pursue very specialized indications, so they might have 5,000 doctors around the world they call on a special type of disease or a disease states. And those like the Bayers and the Pfizer's that try to address every doctor in the world right. and then through the specialists, they require huge sales forces. And I'm pleased to say um, we have the happy position that the interest we're getting so far for a number of our compounds covers both. So oh. there are some companies that want the highly specialized drug, uh, and that's particularly in the kidneys. Um, one of the remarkable things of our uh, kidney drug is that um, it appears to be protective against certain types of chemotherapy. So when you have cancer and you receive chemotherapy, yep. quite often the um, treating specialist will try to balance the damage to the kidneys to the therapeutic benefit and the kidneys are the weak point. So you only get as much dose as your kidneys can tolerate right. failure. It looks like one of our compounds is protective of the kidneys, which will change the way oncologists can do early intervention without damaging the kidneys. So that particular compound is of great interest to one of these niche players where they can get you know, total market share with a relatively small number of referring doctors. So happily, we're in both camps. You're in both camps, which is which is amazing as well. Um, we we talked about news flow going forward, and you spoke about big pharma being interest interested. What sort of lead time are we looking at? Does this take years to get this underway, or are you quite far down the track? So when it comes to news flow, uh, as I said, um, the one B study will be uh, quite um, soon. It's approved uh, and we're just recruiting now. Uh, I would believe, and I'm not in the business of predicting because I didn't predict COVID, <laughs> although <laughs> I was in China warning them about the dangers of pandemics two months before it hit. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but um, the reality is that, um, but I had no idea that COVID was going to be the thing. Um, so, the big pharma companies, uh, it, it's hard to say um, there's mergers and there's a lot of, um, you know, what I do know is they all have struggling pipelines. They're making a lot of money out of their existing drugs. Right. And very few of them have a strong pipeline. So as a drug discovery company, going back to your earlier question, 
if someone made us an offer that we couldn't refuse for our whole portfolio and it was in the interest of our shareholders, mm -hmm. we're obviously willing to do that. If, however, is more likely we'll do a number of licenses, uh, that's also okay. What is interesting, uh, Kerry, is that most pharmaceutical companies, if you license Japan on its own, they'll walk away. They consider that core market. Say, say that again. If you were to license, say, just a Japanese company, yep. they wouldn't take a license because they consider you're taking one third of their market away from them before they start. Right. But they don't consider China core market. So a lot of the pharma companies we're talking to are quite happy if we do a Chinese license and they do the rest of the world. So That's interesting. It's been a really interesting journey for us as well. Um, and look, quite frankly, uh, we need to understand these giant companies and how they operate. And we put a lot of effort into that. And as you can see, as we posted at our last AGM, the criteria we believe pharma use and um, they've come back to us and I speak to a lot of medical directors of Big Pharma and they say, you're one of the few companies that gets it. So they're very complimentary. You've done it before in giving shareholders uh, a great return, I guess, and this is not a prediction. And ladies and gentlemen, do your own research, please. But uh, Nanasonics, uh, the ASX code NAN, not taking away from the company we're talking about at the moment, but just to put it in perspective, you know this space very well. Yes. Yeah, so look, Nanasonics is a great Australian success story. We proudly do nearly all our research in Australia. Um, and Nanasonics started off in a small industrial unit in Alexandria uh, and now um, is in the uh, big Goodman uh, complex in North Ryde. It's on the ASX 200 and um, it's now spoken of in the same breath as Cochlear and ResMed. I'm pleased to say. I don't think in the near term anyone will be speaking about Vectus in the same terms as CSL, but I think we'll be a damn sight closer than most Australian companies. I am so excited for you, but we're running out of time. Um, Maury, I love to finish my interviews in this way, which is kind of wrapping it up in a bow, if you like, and giving just letting us know why three reasons, not four, just three reasons why we should be sitting up and taking notice of Vectus Biosystems right now? Thank you. So I think the first reason is the risk reward is in the best position it can be. The science has been validated. The human safety has been validated. The patents are in place. And now um, there's the greatest chance for a very significant uplift and it's many X. Secondly, and it probably comes first for the Vectors team, uh, we're very focused on a social pact that we're contributing something meaningful. Uh, and people on dialysis, people with heart failure can look forward uh, to a different outcome due to this innovation. And I think that's very important for us. And thirdly, um, Vectors does not have a lot of shares on issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it has, uh, you know, approximately 50 million shares, unlike some biotechs have got 3 billion shares. Uh, we're debt free. We've done an enormous amount of work and we think uh, the future for us would be co-listing on the NASDAQ as our oh, market wow. cap increases. And we're actually talking uh, to some companies uh, in the longer term about that. So I think um, our shareholders uh, realize that we have been under the radar for the first time we're starting to publicize our activities and i think 2023 will be the most exciting year in the company's history well what a great australian success story uh Maury, i'm so glad you came on to small caps today and gave us this overview um as always ladies and gentlemen do your own research but the asx code as i said before is vbs they are really making great strides. And the wonderful thing, as Maury said in his point too, is really helping humanity as well as they go through this some of these challenging uh, health times. So exciting times ahead. Maury Strang, thanks so much for joining me on Small Caps today. And we'll keep you in the loop. Thank you for your time.